Wow, wasn't Solomon's temple amazing? Can you imagine, uh, 3,000 years ago, you're living in Israel and you're headed to Jerusalem to worship God and you're climbing the, the hill that is Jerusalem, the city was on, and as you climb the hills, you approach the city, what you see is this magnificent temple, twice the size of the tabernacle where the people of Israel used to worship God. This temple was 90 feet long, it was 30 feet wide, it was 45 feet high, And when it was completed by Solomon, it was the largest structure in the city of Jerusalem. As I looked at those pictures, and I'm so grateful that a digital animator took the descriptions that are given to us in 1 Kings 6 and 2 Chronicles 3, and they were able to put to image so that we could do a virtual tour of the temple, Solomon's temple, like we just did. As I look at the temple, what stood out to me was not just the the size of the temple, but rather its splendor. Four horns of the altar of sacrifice, that first thing we saw, was made of bronze. The brazen sea with the 12 oxen at its base was also made of bronze. The 10 water basins surrounding the temple that was for cleansing were made of bronze. The two large columns of the temple were made with bronze. The door to the temple was covered with gold. The walls of the temple as you went inside was covered with pure gold. The menorahs were all covered with gold. As you went into the holiest of holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant covered in pure gold. And the cherubim that that protected the Ark of the Covenant in that cube space of the holiest of holies was covered in pure gold. The walls were covered in gold. Where did Solomon get those kind of resources to build such a beautiful temple? To find out where Solomon got the resources to build a temple made of so much gold, please open your red pew Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles Chronicles chapter 29. It may be found on page 452 of your red pew Bible. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. But before I read God's word, let's call upon his spirit again to guide us in the reading and the preaching of his holy word. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the faith of our fathers, the faith of David, the faith of Solomon. Lord, we thank you that as we come together now this morning to read your word, the chronicles telling of the life of David and Solomon, I pray, Lord, that as we read your word, you might speak to us, that we might hear from you, that we might be transformed at the reading and the preaching of your holy word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray and all God's people said, amen. First Chronicles chapter 29, found on page 452, beginning with verse one. Listen to the word of the Lord. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God so far as I was able, the gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and the bronze for the things of bronze, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of onyx and stones for setting, antimony, colored stones, all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give to the house of my God 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for overlaying the walls of the house. And for all the work to be done by craftsmen, gold for the things of gold and silver for the things of silver, who then will offer willingly consecrating himself today to the Lord? Then the leaders of the father's houses made their freewill offerings as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in the care of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, 
for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Here ends the reading of God's word as the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to look again at verses three and four. In fact, I would encourage you to keep First Chronicles 29 open throughout the message as I make reference to it as a part of the message this morning. Let's look again at verses three and four, the description of the amount of gold and silver that was given by David. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own of gold and silver. And because of my devotion to the house of my God, I give to the house of my God 3,000 talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, which was the, the best kind of gold, and 7,000 talents of refined silver. This was pure silver for overlaying the walls of the house. Now, in order for us to really appreciate how much gold this really is, it helps us to know that one talent was worth equal to 75 pounds back then. So King David gave 3,000 talents of gold times 75 equals 225,000 pounds of gold. It would take three 18-wheelers today to transport that much gold. David gave this out of his own personal treasury. And then he gave 7,000 talents of silver, seven times 75 equals 525,000 pounds of silver. That's amazing. David gave generously and sacrificially. As we read in verse two of our text this morning, he gave, I provided for the house of my God so far as I was able. David gave all that he could as far as he was able. Why did David give so much to help build the house of the Lord? Well, for David, giving to God was a demonstration of his love for God. David's giving to God was a demonstration of his love for God. You know, when we really love someone, we will give them whatever we can because we love them. I remember when my wife, Sarah, and I, I realized God was blessing me with a, a wonderful girlfriend. I wanted to ask her to marry me, and so I went shopping for rings, and, and I was a seminary student. I had saved up some money because uh, uh, I had been a consultant before that, but I was like, man, I want to buy the best ring I possibly can, and so I spent as much as I could on that ring that's on her left hand because I wanted to show her how much I love her, and I still do, sweetie. I still do today. <laughs> when you love someone, You'll spend all kinds of money to show how much you love them. David gave so much because he loved God so, so much. Why did David love God so much? Well, if we continue reading our text, and I would encourage you to look along in the Red Pew Bible, uh, 1 Chronicles 29, we see this beautiful prayer that well, that David prays with the people after he's seen this amazing response that not only has he given, but the leaders of the tribes have given and, and everyone has given joyfully. He says this beautiful prayer that we pick up in verse 10. It says, therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people? that we should be able thus to offer willingly. Who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer thus willingly? Who is David? Who was David? If you've been with us the last uh, several months, you know that in, starting in August, we began this sermon series on the life of King David, and we talked about how David was a man after God's own heart. But if you remember, in the middle of August, we talked about how well, when David was first anointed as the next king of Israel, well, he was just a shepherd boy. He was just a teenage shepherd boy. He was the eighth 
the son of Jesse, the youngest son. In fact, in Old Testament times, seven represents a number of wholeness, and, Jesus, and David was outside that number of wholeness, and so he was, in many ways, the forgotten son. In fact, he was out herding his father's sheep when pr- the prophet Samuel shows up to Jesse's house, and he says, I'm here to you know, anoint one of your sons as the next king of Israel, and, and Jesse didn't even think that he'd want to see David. I mean, after all, David is the eighth son. He's the forgotten son. He's the son outside that number of wholeness. And yet God, in his sovereign will, chose to anoint David as the next king of Israel. As we talked about in August, God in his sovereign providence provided victory for David time and time again. God allowed David to defeat the the giant Goliath. In fact, David, as he reflected on his life, he saw that time and time again, God had delivered him from certain death. When he was protecting his father's sheep, you know, he, there was a lion or a bear that would come and, 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 and God would protect David from certain death. God protected David from, from the hand of Goliath the giant. God protected David from the hands of the Philistines. God protected David from the hand of Saul who tried to kill him multiple times. Yes, God was so faithful to deliver David, to save David, to make David king that David couldn't help but love God in return grateful for God's love for him. Yes, we love God because God first loved us. And he's created each one of us with a purpose and a plan. And as we look at the cross of Christ, we know that he has he's saved us so that we might have a relationship with him. And it's in this relationship that David wants to give back to God in gratitude for all that God has done for him. As we continue reading, but who am I? And what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, O God, and of of your own we have given you. God gives to us, and we simply give back to God what he's already given to us. For we were strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand, and all is your own. David reminds us that all that we have is ultimately a gift from God. As we read in Psalm 24, verse 1, at the very beginning of the service of worship, we said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, for he created it. All that we have and all that we are is ultimately a a gift from God. And so when we give back to God, we demonstrate our love for God. Our giving to God demonstrates our love for God. Can you say that with me? Our giving to God demonstrates our love for God. So we know from Scripture that David gave as much as he was able because he loved God so much. But why did David give when he gave? Well, if you were to read 1 Chronicles 28, you'll see the story that David, after he had finally allowed peace to reign and he had established his throne in Jerusalem and he was well along in life, he realized, I need to build a temple for the Lord for for I live in a house, but but the Lord is is worshiped in a a tabernacle, in a tent. And so he has it in his heart to build a, a permanent structure, a beautiful temple where God might be worshiped. But God tells David, it is not for you to build the temple. For you are a man of war and there has been much blood on your hand. No, it is for your son Solomon to build the temple. And so as you read in 1 Chronicles 28, you know, David gives the plans, the the, the architectural plans, the drawings to Solomon on how to to build this beautiful temple. And David explains these drawings, these plans have, have come from God. And so now David has given Solomon the plans, but he also knows Solomon is going to need the resources to build the plans. Solomon is going to need not just the plans, but he's going to need the supplies. And friends, that's where we are today. We have, and we're finishing out the plans. What we need are the supplies. You may remember uh, back in uh, the spring, we showed you a beautiful image of the a house. In fact, I think we've got that picture we can show you again just to remind everybody of what we're trying to do here. 
Of course, this is the old A&O house, and we love it, and God bless it, but it's too small for the number of youth that are coming to our church. We have, we have some concerns. Uh, foundationally, it's got a big crack there. It's standing up, but we're not sure. We know we can't expand it. So we've, working with um, many ministries and working with um, architects from Houston, we've decided to, to build a bigger Ano house. It'll be twice the size, as the, as the temple was twice the size of the tapper, our, our new house. So we want to show that next slide if we can. That's the new Ano house. It's going to be glorious. Youth from all over the city will continue to come and, and, and learn about Jesus there. And we've got a next picture. I want to show the next slide if we can. That's the side, we've got a basketball court, and that's very important for an old basketball player, right? Kids are gonna get to play and have a lot of fun. There's gonna be a porch there, if we can show the next slide there. This is the wraparound porch, and of course it gives you access. Uh, It'll be fully handicap accessible, and kids can hang out on the steps of the porch while others play uh, basketball on the uh, uh, west side of the building. And then we've got the next picture I wanna show. Another angle there, there's that side shot of the house, this new a and house that youth from all over the city of Amarillo will get to come and, and learn about Jesus and grow in their walk with Jesus and ultimately to worship Jesus. As we wind down the design phase of our campaign and we prepare to move towards the construction phase, we know that we're gonna need a lot of cash to, well, to pay for this building. Now I wanna be real clear here this morning The actual construction will not begin until the early part of next year, but we have some really smart men and women on our stewardship committee and some really smart members of our board of trustees and some really smart elders on our session, and we all know that it's very difficult to raise money for a nonprofit in January. That's why nobody does that, (laughs) because everybody does most of their end of year giving in December. If you're like me, your house is going to be flooded with letters from every university you ever attended, every nonprofit you've ever supported, even this church, I'll send you a letter, believe me, to encourage you, to thank you for your giving and to remind you to finish out your pledge for the year. We do this because we know that the majority of Americans, well, they do most of their giving in December. And so in order to avoid that, we wanna, here in the middle of November, we're asking everyone to give what they can today. That's $10. That's $100, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000, whatever the Lord has laid on your heart to give. We're asking you to give today so that we'll have the money, the resources that we need on hand to begin the building. Because as a church, we want to avoid debt as much as possible. We read in Proverbs 22, verse seven, that the the borrower is slave to the lender. And right now we're debt free and we wanna stay that way. Now in April, most of us, and we made a pledge to the uh, GROW campaign and we had a wonderful participation rate, which is, which is great. So the vast majority of the families in our church pledged to give to the GROW campaign and, and many of you have already begun to give, to give and we're so grateful for that. That's helped us cover our architectural fees as those have come in. And, uh, and some of you have already given everything. You said, man, I'm so excited about this. I'm gonna give it all up front. They, you gave everything when you made your pledge and we're so grateful for that. What moves someone to be so generous so quickly? Well, I've used this illustration in the past, a couple of years ago, but I think it's worth repeating. When we think about giving and we think about our life, this rope represents our life and it's now tangled. (laughs) That's all right, I'll keep moving. And life, this rope actually represents all of eternity and I have really tangled this up well. Man, it worked a lot better in my office when I did it there. Anyway, you can see that as we continue to unravel this rope, that this rope, which was so well nicely wrapped up by me, <laughs> here we go. The best laid plans of mice and men, I guess, right here. This red strip at the very end of this rope actually represents your life. And the white part represents all eternity, even though it's tangled. And when you think about your life, it's pretty small in light of eternity. But what we do during that red strip is impacts the rest of eternity. 
So what we do with the time and the talents and the treasures that God gives to us has a way of impacting the rest of our lives. So what are you doing with that red piece? It's nice when you have a broken finger too, you're trying to untangle this thing. But I'll get it done here. Now we're, getting, we're making progress. You gotta have to break that one point. There we go, all right, now we're, now we're on the way. Our church, um, on Wednesday night, several of us have been reading through the Bible in 90 days, which is an incredible uh, amount of reading. You have to read 12 pages a day to accomplish that. We're finally in the New Testament, hallelujah, thanks be to God. And as we finally have gotten to Matthew, we got to a parable, Matthew 25. Happens to be my favorite parable because I'm a finance major and I love the story of the talents and how men are able to invest it and double what they made. Well, as we continue to read Matthew 25, we have that great story uh, that Jesus tells. It's a parable of judgment that he tells right before he is arrested and crucified. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a master who had three servants. And to one servant, he gave five talents. To another servant, he gave two talents. And to another servant, he gave one talent. And then he left. Now for order for us to really appreciate that story, we need to know a couple of facts. One is that a talent back then in the first century represented 6,000 denarii. It was a, a type of coin. 6,000 denarii. Well, one denarius equals a day's wage. So if you divide 6,000 by 365 for the common labor, that's over 15 years worth of wages. This master gave his ser servant over 15,000 years of wages, even the one who just got the one. So it's better to think of it, that story as 15 years worth of wages or 30 years of wages or 75 years of wages. Well, as the story goes, the master, I think I got it, the master comes home, hallelujah. Ah, <laughs> oh, there's a little bit left. The master comes home and he asks each servant to give an account. What did you do with what I gave you? Well, the one who had the five talents made five more. And the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come enjoy your master's happiness. And then the other one with the two talents, he said, what'd you do with the two talents I gave to you? He said, well, I, I was able to make two more. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come enjoy the, ma the uh, joy of your master's happiness. And so we got it, hallelujah. <laughs> and so as we, uh, again, the servant with the one talent though, what did he do? Do y'all remember what he did? He buried it in the ground. You guys have been to Sunday school, good job. He buried it in the ground. And what did the master say? You wicked, lazy servant. You did nothing with what I gave you. My friends, this sermon series about maximizing your gifts is about what are we doing with this little red section that we have. This time on this earth, in light of all eternity, what are we doing? Because what we do here has a ripple effect for all eternity. And my prayer is that when we get to heaven, that God will look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And people tell us today that the average uh, age, death, life expectancy here in the United States is 78. I know that some of you are above average. <laughs> Charlie Hargrave, where are you? You are above average, my friend. Rex Vermillion, you are above average. We have some saints here who are above average. I hope you're all above average. But the fact is, none of us know when we're gonna die. And what we do with this little red section impacts the rest of this. So what are we doing with the time and the talents and the treasures God has given to us? Now, in the parable, the talent represents gold specifically. It can also represent anything that has limited. It could represent time, as Dan shared last week. We don't know how long we're going to be here, but what did we do with the time while we were here? You know, every time I do a funeral, I'm reminded that our time on this earth is short. 
This last Thursday, I did a graveside service for one of the faithful members of our congregation. He had not been able to go to worship for quite some time because of mobility issues. In fact, when we started this Grow campaign uh, last year, I, uh, as a part of our vision of being a, having 100% participation, I called him and his wife because, well, I hadn't seen him in church in a while, and I wanted to make sure they knew what God was doing with this campaign. And I shared with them the vision that we're trying to build a new youth house so that our church can continue to minister to the youth of our city, and we're building a new children's wing where there'll be an indoor preschool playground, and there'll be an outdoor elementary age playground, and it'll be more secure than the one we have now, and it'll allow a place for fellowship and worship and, and gathering of our young people. And also, we're going we're gonna to build a new ramp in the north entrance, and so we're going to make this campus more handicap accessible. And as I shared that vision with this elderly couple, I was amazed at their response. You see, they don't have any children in our church. They don't have any grandchildren in our church. But he was excited to be a part of this vision, to see the, our church make an investment in the next generation. He said, oh, we've gotta do this for the kids. He said, Howard, how long is the campaign? I told him, well, it's three years. He said, well, I may not be here in three years. So can I give you the whole amount right now? Can I give you my whole pledge right now? And I said, man, that would be great, John. And he did. As we had his graveside service Thursday, we talked to the family. And I know without a doubt, because of the way John lived his life, the way that he came here when he could, every Sunday for worship, the way that he uh, read God's word and studied and was a part of a Bible study every week when he could be here, the way that he used his time to help serve meals on wheels for the, those who cannot uh, feed themselves and indigent in our community, and the way that he gave so generously and sacrificially at the end of his life to help make an investment, to leave a legacy for the next generation. I said, I have without a doubt. Well, I know without a doubt that because Jesus lives, John also lives. And as he encounters Jesus in paradise today, I'm confident that Jesus looks at him and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share the joy of your master's happiness. What are we gonna do with the little bit of red we've got? The time, the talents, and the treasures. How will we use this red that we're given to invest, to make a difference for all eternity? For Jesus tells us that we shouldn't store up our treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy, but rather we should store up our treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. And every time we give to the work of God's kingdom, God is able to take what we give, like that little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus, the five barley loaves and the two fish, and he's able to multiply its impact to feed so many, many, many more. Over 5,000 people were fed that day through that one small lunch. How many children, how many youth are going to be able to be blessed by our investment today, by giving in gratitude for what God has given to us? I want you to notice something, though, in our text, specifically at the end of 1 Chronicles 29. Look again in your Bibles. What do you see? The heading of the last section, the death of David. We read in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 26. Thus David, the son of Jesse, reigned over all Israel. The time that he reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. Then he died at a good age, full of days, riches, and honor. And Solomon, his son, reigned in his place. David makes provisions for the temple towards the very end of his life. He knows that the end is near. Just as John gave generously to this church, he says, this is my last chance to make a big splash. I want to do what I can for the work of God's kingdom in gratitude for what God has done for us. And Solomon, to his credit, makes sure that the temple is built before he builds his own palace. Notice in the First Chronicles, if you read First Chronicles 28 and 29, you'll see that David never gives Solomon plans for his house, for the palace. He doesn't give him uh, proceeds to, or supplies to build Solomon's palace. He simply gives to help build the temple because David wants to leave a legacy of faith, a legacy of worship for all of his descendants who will follow. David wants to make sure that the temple gets built before the palace. Reminds me of a family in our church. As a part of this Grow campaign, we had an opportunity to 
to pray and ask everyone to give, to pledge whatever they can. And there's a, there's a family in our church who had been working diligently to, to pay off their house early. But as they heard the vision of this grow campaign, they said, you know, they felt convicted by God that, that they were called to, to build and finish building God's house before they built their own house, before they finished paying off their own house early. And so they've chosen to take the money they would have given to pay off their own house early to help give to the Grow Campaign, to, to make a, a big splash, to make an internal investment in the life of so many, many young people. What is God calling you to give today? I hesitate to tell this story because I know what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. The left hand shouldn't know what the right hand is doing. But as I read First Chronicles 29, I see David's example of giving helped inspired others to give as well. And so I want to tell you, last weekend, uh, I took my middle child, Elizabeth, on a daddy-daughter trip to Dallas. She turned 13, so to celebrate her 13th birthday, we went on a daddy-daughter trip. I've promised each one of my kids that when you turn 13, I will take you anywhere in driving distance for a daddy-daughter weekend or a father-son weekend. My first daughter, Hannah, uh, was excited to do this, and she said, Daddy, I want to go to Houston. Is that driving distance, Houston? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, 10 hours later, <laughs> we were in Houston. My daughter Hannah was born in Houston. She loved that time. And, and actually, a few years after that trip, we were talking as a family about where our kids had gone on some trips and what was their favorite trip. And I remember Elizabeth said that her favorite trip back then was Disneyland. We got to go to Disneyland one time. We drove to Disneyland. We did the, the, the Griffins version of the Griswold vacation, we drove all the way. Um, we didn't strap anyone on the top of our car, though, or anything like crazy like that, but uh, we did get there. We asked John, what was your favorite? He said, man, we went to Mount Rushmore. That was amazing. We drove to Mount Rushmore because we drive pretty much everywhere as a family. And we said, Hannah, what was your favorite? He said, Daddy, the time we went to Houston. I was like, Houston, all right. But it was great. We had a great time. So I wanted to recreate that with my daughter, Elizabeth. And my daughter, Elizabeth, was born in Dallas. And so she said, Daddy, I want to go to Dallas. I said, all right, let's go to Dallas. As a part of our time in Dallas, I said, sweetie, you know, your great-grandmother is buried in Kaufman, Texas. Why don't we go to Kaufman? You can see that cemetery where she's buried. You never knew her, but you know, this is your grandmother's uh, mom, my mom's mom. It would have been my Eunice. Her name was uh, Tina Ruth. And uh, of course, Lois would be my mom, Ruth Ann. And so we, we went there and we looked at the graveside. And I knew this Sunday was coming up. And, and back in the spring, my wife and I had been praying about what God was calling us to give to this campaign. And we were convicted that we were called to give a number we, that we had never given before. It was the number that kept coming back to us, and we said, man, we've got to give this, this amount. We're not exactly sure how that's going to work, but we're going to trust God, and we're going to write that down, and, and we'll see what God does. Well, as I'm standing at the graveside of my grandmother, and I'm telling her about what a wonderful woman of God she was, and how she taught Sunday school for decades, very similar to you, your mother, Michael Ann, and, and how my mom was raised w with a mother who taught her Sunday school. And in fact, I remember one time I was grumbling to my mom. I said, Mom, why do we have to go to Sunday school every Sunday? And my mom retorted back. She said, you know, Howard, I was raised as a Baptist, and I had to go to church on the mornings and the evenings. You're getting off cheap. <laughs> then I thank God I was a Presbyterian, not a Baptist. But anyway, my grandmother was a faithful woman of God. And when she died, she gave a few thousand dollars to each one of her grandkids, just kind of a final gift to us. And, uh, you know, with a degree in finance, uh, I decided back in 1998 to invest that money and, uh, into an S&P 500 index fund. And uh, if you can do this, if you can put money in an S&P 500 index fund, I did it with Vanguard, and you can leave it alone over like 20 years, it'll grow. And so as we were talking about what we're going to do, and we're trying to save for kids' college, too, at the same time, right? We talked about what we're supposed to give. And as I'm looking at my grandmother's gravestone, I'm remembering how she shared the gospel with me in that little bridge illustration. How God is holy, but man is unholy. And our sin separates us from God. But God, in his great love for us, sent his son to do for us what we can never do for ourselves. He lived in perfect obedience to our heavenly father, so that when he died on the cross, he died as that perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. And then on the third day, he rose again, conquering both sin and death on our behalf. And that we can have the, the gift of eternal life, the assurance of eternal life, the gift of a relationship with him for all eternity. If we will simply open our hearts to him. For God has built a bridge between us and him through his son, Jesus. My grandmother prayed, you know, she said, would you pray to receive Christ? And I did, my, the age is six. 
And as I thought about the impact my grandmother had on my life and what my grandmother loved, nothing would delight her more than to know that the money she had given to me is now going to be given to the Grow Campaign to help build a children's wing and a youth house that her great-grandchildren can enjoy. And not just them, but children for generations and generations to come. What is God calling you to give today? I knew Sunday that's exactly what God wanted to give and by God's amazing grace, and I believe in providence because I'm Presbyterian, Friday the stock market closed at an all-time high. The S&P 500 index did and this is a great time to cash in stocks, to give mutual funds to the work of God's kingdom. That little bit of red impacts all of eternity. What are you gonna do in that red? How might we give in such a way that we demonstrate our great love for what God has done for us? David gave so generously because he wanted to leave a legacy of faith, a legacy of worship for all of his descendants. And what's most ironic, that as we read the Gospel of Matthew chapter one and we see the genealogy of Jesus, we see that the greatest descendant of David is Jesus, the Son of God, the great I Am, the Good Shepherd, the Savior of the world. As you read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life in gratitude for God's amazing grace. What is God calling us to give today so that we might continue to do the work of God's kingdom while we're here on this earth to the glory of his name? Please join me as you pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you, Lord, for the example of generosity that you give to all of us. That even though, Lord, we don't deserve your great love and the gifts you give to us, Lord, you and your grace have chosen to, to bless us. And we know from Genesis chapter 12 that you blessed Abraham to be a blessing so that all nations on the earth would be blessed through him. And again, as we look at the genealogy of Jesus, we see Abraham and David, the forefathers of Jesus, and how the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled through Jesus, that the Davidic covenant is fulfilled through Jesus. Jesus is the one that we gather every Sunday to worship here, to give all praise and glory and honor to you. So God, I pray, Lord, that as we continue to, to worship and continue to reflect, Lord, that you might speak to our hearts. Tell us what it is you're calling us to give as a demonstration of our great love for you. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your son who is the Christ and all God's people said, amen.